Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another Fearless Conversation. Uh, I'm Dr. Sandra Miles, and I will be serving as the moderator. Before we get started with our conversation, we will, um, as our practice, uh, ask Dr. Craig Welfel to give an overview of the Fearless Conversation Conversations series. So, Dr. Welfel. Thank you, Dr. Miles, and uh, thank you, panelists, and welcome, everyone, to the Fearless Conversation series. Um, we're taking up these, these conversations as a campus in partnership with the community because our core values, we feel, compel us to find ways to transform difficult issues that might threaten to divide us into opportunities, opportunities to build understanding and to model productive dialogue across differences. It sounds a little bit dramatic, but at risk, we feel if we don't do this, is our existence as a community at all? The issues that we talk about in this series, like our differences, are not new. Indeed, they're so old that it's often appalling. But there's a new urgency to take them up, and simultaneously a kind of lack of faith in our capacity to grapple with them together. And if we lose that capacity, that capacity to talk with one another, we don't just lose dialogue between us, we lose us. We lose our community altogether. So here we are, and we have difficult work to do. To paraphrase Mr. Rogers, we must talk about the difficult things because those things are part of being human. And when those parts of being human become manageable, excuse me, <coughs> mentionable, they become manageable. The question, of course, is, is how to manage them. Uh, but we feel like one way forward is reflected in the obligations that flame, frame the conversation tonight, which are also the bedrock of democratic process and of academic conversation. Among those obligations is not that we have to agree with each other anymore, or that we should think the same things. Education is not to teach us what to think, but to give us the tools and the information to do the work of thought. And in that context, it's diversity of opinion that makes us stronger. So we want to represent a variety of viewpoints. And it turns out there are more than two sides to things. But we also have to demand that those viewpoints are represented in a good faith manner, that they're not talking points and straw men, but have reasoned and evidenced arguments, that they're not simplifications, but dive into nuances and complexities. And we also have to seek expertise to guide us, to help us sift fact from opinion and truth from error. On the flip side, a conversation means that we should listen and listen generously. We should seek to empathize and understand and come ready to learn about the impacts of our ideas and practices on others, people beyond our own personal experience. So keep in mind as you listen that we're here to discuss ideas which are separate from who people are. People are complex and they're not defined by a single idea. And ideas, especially when they're difficult and personal, often come out wrong. And most importantly, remember that people can change their minds and that this is in fact the goal, even if it's the hardest goal, of dialogue and critical thinking. That last phrase, critical thinking, is a bit of an education buzzword and like a lot of other buzzwords, it can cover over a lot of BS and it can be sort of hard to define. But the best definition of critical thinking I've ever heard has all the cutting simplicity of a truth. It's a question. When was the last time that you had a conversation with someone about something that you really cared about and changed your mind? Not their mind, but your mind. And I think the answer for most of us is that it's probably been a long time. And that's a sad thing. Perhaps the end of something more valuable than we might realize. It's the end of a kind of freedom. The freedom to choose what you think and believe is the essence of education. And tonight, we're here to begin thinking about issues and questions from different points of view and about their consequences for all of us so that we can have the freedom to choose what to do about it. That's not just an educational obligation, it's an ethical and perhaps even a spiritual one. So let's let that define our community tonight and begin our work. And this is of course only a beginning not a final conversation, but a conversation here that we hope starts many more out there. So welcome to Fearless Conversations. Dr. Miles. Thank you so much, Dr. Welkel. So February is Black History Month, and we have had the opportunity to understand Black histories and celebrate those who impacted not just the country, but the world with their activism and accomplishments. Tonight, our panelists will discuss the history of Black History Month, what lessons can be learned from the experiences of Black history makers, and how Black history helps tell the story of what it means to be an American. So I will ask that our panelists uh, introduce themselves, and we will start with Dr. Rivera. 
Good evening, Dr. Miles and everybody else. Thank you so much for having me. I am uh, Dave Rivera, Jr. I am the Director and Freytag Professor for Hospitality and Tourism Management uh, here at Flagler College. I am in the middle of my second year, so I'm still relatively new to Flagler College, um, but I absolutely love being here and I'm really excited about the conversation this evening. All right, and you forgot to mention, you're also the advisor to the Black Student Union. Yes, I'm sorry, I did forget that. <laughs> I, I figured Rory might throw me the shout out on that one, so I apologize. All right, uh, so speaking of Rory, uh, Rory Thompson. Um, hello, I'm Rory Thompson. I am a junior here at Flagler College. Um, I guess I can do the normal spiel that we do for icebreakers. Um, my, ma my major is media production and media studies with a minor in film studies. I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. I am the president of the Black Student Union here at Flagler. I do a lot of things at Flagler. I'm heavily involved and um, I'm glad to be here tonight. I'm just gonna ask that you kind of turn down all that enthusiasm. It's a little overwhelming. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. And uh, last but certainly not least, Ms. Gail Phillips. Hi, I'm Regina Gale Phillips. I'm the executive director for the Lincolnville Museum and Cultural Center here in St. Augustine. And we cover 450 years and some of African-American history here in the city of St. Augustine and St. John's County. And I'm happy to be here with you this evening to sh share in this conversation. Thank you, and we're happy to have you. Uh, so before we get started, I will do a little housekeeping. We will have time at the end of the conversation for questions from our attendees. So if you would like to ask a question, please put it in the Q&A box, not the chat. The chat is not being regularly monitored, uh, but when we get to the end, I will be going to the Q&A box to pull questions if you have any. Uh, so my first question I will pose to um, Dr. Rivera, and then if anyone else on our panel would like to chime in, feel free to do so. Uh, February is Black History Month, and many individuals, groups, schools, and organizations across the country are offering programming and observance. Will you please provide us our own history lesson and share with us how Black History Month got its start? Who were the, those influential uh, in the establishment of Black History Month, and why is it observed? Okay, so I'm going to, I guess, give a, a, a simple of... Uh, a background history as I possibly can. Otherwise, this could take up the entire uh, fearless conversation. But uh, Black History Month, uh, the creator, the thought behind it was Carter Woodson. And Carter Woodson really looked at how he can create something that would research and promote positive achievements of African Americans uh, in the United States. So it, it was started with the promotion of the positivity in mind. And, and I, I know we'll get a little bit probably into a conversation of, of how some people view uh, Black history versus what it was started for, but that was the uh, original intent uh, to celebrate the celebration of not just uh, quote unquote Blacks, but also looking at people of color that have African backgrounds or descents that are African and how they can be celebrated. Uh, let's look at the positive achievements that they've made and the positive impact that they've made on history, um, and they should be celebrated through the month of February. Now, when you go back to its roots, uh, it really was conceived in about 1925, 1926, and it was just a week. It was a Black History Week. Um, so I'm really excited that as a not so young man anymore, but as a young man growing up, having a chance to have Black History Month was was really influential in my life, the celebration of all these achievements of African-Americans. Um, I can't imagine trying to regulate it to just a week. And also even the idea of a month, regulating it just to a month seems crazy because throughout the year in my household, we are celebrating uh, what I like to say is history. But if we're gonna give it a, a label, it's okay, we're celebrating black history. It's something we do in my household all the time. To take it a little bit further uh, with regards to uh, Black History Month, starting in that week, it wasn't expanded into a month until about 50 years after the, the beginning of the, the Black History Week. So here we have uh, 50 years later, so we're looking at about 1975, 1976, it was finally expanded out into a month. Um, 
And that was around the time that it was first really recognized by one of our US presidents as an event that should be celebrated. And I believe it was Gerald Ford that recognized Black History Month really for the first time. Um, as you move through farther and kind of, let me reverse back a little bit, the idea of Black History Month really being taken to the next level. Um, in about 1969, 1970, you had Kent State looking at a celebration of, of Black History Month. Uh, also the further roots of why February, and a lot of people don't pay attention to this, um, and hopefully we'll talk about this a little bit more, uh, was the, the pinpointing of February tied into uh, the birthdays of two individuals that were seen to really push the Black Initiative or the African American Initiative forward. You had Abraham Lincoln, which hopefully we'll talk about his impact on uh, African American history, and Frederick Douglass, both their birthdays in the month of February being so influential, and that was a big tie uh, going forward. I, I will say that when you look at Black history as an arc, the, the idea of the celebration of the goodness, that has not always been the case with some people when they look at Black history. Uh, a lot of times with Black history, they, they freeze on just what I refer to as a dark time, um, where they, they kind of just go through the slavery piece and then they stop as if that's the end of Black history once, uh, quote unquote, Blacks were uh, emancipated well, that's the end of Black history. Now, now that's all we need to focus on. And it goes so much beyond that. But unfortunately, that's where a lot of people stop their, their understanding or their willingness to learn about Black history. Celebration is what this is all about. It, it's something that we have to look at the good, the bad, and the ugly. But the focus of this should be the good and that American history was built on the backs of Blacks. And Black history is American history. So I'll, I'll go ahead and leave it at that because I know we have other individuals that may want to add to it. Yeah, I uh, when you were speaking, I was um, thinking that I had recently learned, I didn't realize that Black History Month uh, started in the 70s. And so um, when, I, when I realized that, I was like, huh. So I am one of these people I, when I was born, Black History Month was already a thing. And so I know no other way of being other than Black History Month is, is February. We celebrate um, the accomplishments of our history uh, during this time. And it, it made me think oddly about um, this generation of people who know no other context other than uh, living in a world where a Black man has been president of the United States. Like they have no before. And so it really, it really made me be um, more reflective when I learned that. The other thing I like that you brought up was this um, sometimes desire to focus on slavery as the beginning and the end of Black history. And, you know, we know that it is neither the beginning or the end of our history. And so I uh, really appreciate your comments. Do any of our other panelists want to add anything to this historical um, context of Black History Month? Sure. I'm probably the only person in the room old enough to remember when we had Black History Week. And that's what we had in my elementary school when I was growing up. And I can remember it being a time where we actually decorated the hallways and you know drew pictures. And it was all about Lincoln and Frederick Douglass and you know a few other people because the information that we have at our fingertips today was not readily available at that point in time. And I also want to add, even with the Carter G. Woodson, I always like to um, add a little bit of local history to everything that I talk about, because that's what we do. And he actually, through the uh, Journal of um, Negro History at the time, he sent a writer to Avalis, um, Spain, to actually research Fort Mose, which had been covered up um, from the history. And so they were able to go back and, and get actually documents that were translated to so that they knew that it actually was a free uh, settlement there. And then later Zora Neale Hurston wrote about it and then it became more popularized. So we can thank him also for digging up that bit of history that was covered up uh, in, in our local um, history books. I learn something new every day. <laughs> um, so I will move on. Oh, Rory, did you want to add anything? Or okay, so I will move on to the next question, and this is open to anyone on the panel who would like to answer. 
Um, can you share with us some of the significant events and milestones in U.S. Black history? And who are some of the individuals you feel have greatly contributed to Black history? So I'll go if nobody else wants to go. I, I mean, there's so I, I was good. I was going to say I was I was deferring to to you because I was I'm so excited to be actually on this panel with you because this is what Black history should be about. Um, you know, I'm a not so young. Rory is young, but we get to learn from the generation that's come. So, Miss Regina, I'm excited to hear what what you have to say on on this. Well, I, I'm going to just tell you that you know the opposite of what you guys were saying. People like to confine. Uh, Black History Month to talk about slavery, we get the opposite where they just want to talk about the civil rights movement. So we know that, as you said, um, Dr. Miles, it began before, it doesn't begin with slavery. You know, our history is very rich, goes way back. Um, so in the Lincolnville Museum, we start talking about our out of Africa story. We talk about the Moors who were Blacks who went to Iberia and impacted that culture there. And we talk about some of the conquistadors that came to the Americas in those early days. And uh, eventually we do get to um, Fort Mose and to Lincolnville. So there are so many stories and, and so many people that made impact throughout time. And I think that, you know, just the beginning of what um, Carter G. Woodson started with Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, you know, um, that is probably the, um, Abraham Lincoln is what we were taught growing up was like, you know, this is the beginning of, of freedom for black people in America because of the Emancipation Proclamation. And of course we just did a program, you know, or we're in the middle of a series about that and how it all relates to um, African-Americans being a part of American history or being really, as you said, Dr. Rivera, uh, we are, American history, all history is American history. I think that um, what this does in terms of looking at this, uh, in terms of who were some of the uh, people that stood out, we have to look at what time period we we're talking about, how did they make a greater impact? And I just had a few names and you know, this is not exhaustive, but you know, outside of those two people, Frederick Douglass, because he was a great abolitionist and, and emancipation with uh, Lincoln, we also had uh, Harriet Tubman who risked her life again and again as a woman to go back and, and make other people, um, give them access to freedom uh, through her Underground Railroad. We had people who were great educators like W.B. Du Bois who, who broke a whole mold where black people were not uh, deemed to have intellectual capacity. He was the first black to graduate from Harvard University. So, you know, it brings another whole spin on who we are as a people. And of course, he had many challengers in his day. He's also the person that helped to found the NAACP, which was a great champion of uh, African American causes for the last hundred, last hundred and um, twenty years, to be honest with you. And uh, Mary McLeod Bethune, if I could bring it a little closer to home, who was a great woman of the 20th century who uh, bought education to a lot of uh, young black boys and girls now, but she started with young women. And not just that, but she, her relationships to be able to go from being the uh, child of slaves to move into being the first woman to have her statue in the hall, statuary hall in Congress says a lot to me about the people she was able to impact and influence in her lifetime. And of course, I have one other woman that, um, because I don't want to just hog this, I got two people I'm going to mention. One is a woman, and that's Anna B. Um, uh, Wells Barnett, because of the work that she did as a journalist. I, my background is as a journalist, and so I'm always, uh, you know, dear to women who, who wrote about things and uh, took great risks doing that. And Lerone Bennett, who was the editor of Ebony Magazine, which bought us all those great stories that are now part of our archives for what happened through the early days of African-American history, um, the 20th century history. So um, those are a few that I had. Thank you. Dr. Rivera or Rory, either one. Oh, I was going to say, I was going to let Rory go since I had started the thing. Go ahead, Rory. All right, now I'm gonna meet it. Um, so 
as being a young person, like we learn, you know, and in, in school that Black history basically started with Martin Luther King and ended with Martin Luther King, at least in like Florida. Florida's textbooks are really, really bad. Um, they don't like to bring up the past in any way. Um, but for me, like as a young person, especially someone who's in the media industry, um, it's, it's so like I've learned a lot coming to college about like black history within the media industry. Um, like a lot of people don't know the name Oscar Mijot. I think I'm saying it wrong, but um, he was like the first black filmmaker who like made feature films and um, or at least one of the early pioneers of the um, black film movement and like seeing come from that from Oscar all the way to like Jordan Peele is just crazy to see. And um, I think honestly, and I, I think that people who are in the media industry are some of the more important people in black history because the industry is actively like trying to make us look like hoodlums or gangsters or drug dealers, you know, hood rats, anything. They're trying to make us look bad, but there's always, you know, creators who are making us look accurate um, and look like humans. Um, and I've had a lot of discussions with my friends about how black films have like, not only impacted me, but impacted like my friends and everything. And it's just impacted the world. I mean, when Black Panther came out, which came out like three years ago today, like we all saw how much that changed, like how people saw black people. Everybody was saying they were from Wakanda, even if they didn't, you know, look like they're originally from Wakanda. And I think that having people who are in the industry of media that are like taking down barriers, um, I, I honestly, I can't even name them all because there are so many people who we don't know and then those that we do know. But I, I really like, for me, I can throw out some names. I, I love Fred Hampton, you know, Toni Morrison. Um, I could go on all the revolutionaries, um, but we're probably gonna talk about them throughout this whole entire thing. And I just think that everybody who's like broken down the barriers and done something to change how we as black people are in this, like are treated in this world are really the most important people. Um, you know, from Serena Williams to Jackie Robinson, you know, just being a trailblazer as a black person in America, I think that's really the more, I think, I, honestly, I think every black person is an important black person in history. Um, that's really where I was trying to go with that. But like, that's how I really feel is that every black person is going to make their mark on this world, no matter how small or how big. Um, and it's, it's just, you know, yeah, it's really important that we have to kind of just recognize that. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Now, Dr. Rivera, what are your thoughts? Oh, man, there's there are so many. And um, as you were going, I'm kind of running through a Rolodex in my mind of especially with some of the ones that my father talked about quite a bit. So one of the ones that I always bring up and speaking of Black History Month, Nat Turner uh, with the revolt, um, I think that was such an important aspect. Uh, in Black history, which actually, when you look at it, is such an impact on American history. Um, Marcus Garvey um, is such a, an important figure as well. And um, growing up, here's a, another, it wasn't just one group, one individual is a group of individuals, uh, but the Red Tails, uh, the Tuskegee Airmen during World War II. Um, and really what you look at what they did, uh, we were fighting for the world as, as Americans and they helped turn the tide. Um, they, they never really lost uh, a mission. They, they never failed at any mission they, they did. They, they really changed the tide uh, in the war. And if anybody neglects to realize that, I mean, we could have ended up under German control, right? If, if not for the Tuskegee Airmen, I think we, we need to recognize, uh, recognize that. Uh, being a baseball player, Jackie Robinson means the world to me. Um, one of the biggest honors I ever had was playing Jackie Robinson in a school play. So um, those are, are just some of them. And then I wanna mention some that a lot of people don't really bring up. So we know Rosa Parks, you know, she, she didn't move. But before Rosa Parks, there was Claudette Colvin who, who did not move. Um, but unfortunately, given the time, they just um, were worried the kind of message that it may have, she was a teenager, uh, she was um, pregnant. 
They were worried that the image that it would portray, and it's a shame that somebody's civil liberties were put aside because they were worried about the image. Um, so then you had Rosa Parks uh, who decided not to move and, and that helped move that movement uh, going forward. Other key moments, we mentioned Martin Luther King, but Malcolm X, um, a lot of people, you know, some people are neglect mentioning Malcolm X. I think they, they feel he was maybe a little too radical, but not only the, the impact that both of those men had, but the impact that their assassination had on this country and, and, and what it meant um, and the ripple effect. Uh, so that situation uh, there. Um, we're also excited about Kamala Harris, uh, but in 1972, there was Shirley, and I believe I'm saying this right, Chisholm. Uh, she, she was a presidential candidate, right? So we got to look, she blazed a trail. Um, and, and I'm not discounting Kamala Harris and what she's done, but there was a path there that was laid before Kamala Harris came along. Um, and we need to recognize that with without Shirley Chisholm, um, we we may not have Kamala Harris making this move going forward. Um, and now Kamala Harris, the uh, vice president. So um, when you look at some of those moments and, and what they mean, at least for for me, and I look at my my kids and what they mean to my kids, for us, Black history and talking about these and highlighting them all the time. Uh, we, be, we don't believe in blowing out somebody's light in order to try and make somebody else shine brighter. We think let's shine the light on great accomplishments and everybody should be excited about what these accomplishments mean and how they better everybody around. Um, and then just some last ones that I wanted to mention, uh, Oprah Winfrey, right? Who would have thought, um, especially when, if you haven't read any of her books or listened to her speak, um, that's gotta be probably the most inspirational story I've ever heard in my life. Uh, Oprah Winfrey is is one of them, uh, Colin Powell. Um, you know, he became the first Secretary of State. He was a man of color, and I believe it was two thousand one. I think or two thousand two thousand one, um, and that that was such a momentous occasion. From there, and you know, not to be cliche, but Barack Obama. Uh, for the you know, I was one honestly growing up. Uh, I never thought I would see a, a black man as president, and. I would tell people, I said, I don't think it's gonna happen in my lifetime. And when it happened, I was finally able to tell my children, honestly, if you wanna be president, you could be president because there's somebody that looks like me and somebody that looks like you who can be president. Look, this man did it, you can do it. And before that, I felt it was hollow words whenever I told my kids, yeah, you can be anything you wanna be, including president, because none of the presidents ever looked like them. So um, I'll go ahead and, and end on that note kind of going from the beginning and, and taking it to now. Yeah, so um, when you all were talking, like all of the thoughts were going through my head. Um, earlier, Gail had made a, a comment about um, thinking of thinking local. And so I started, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, and there's so many um, schools named after incredible um, historic Black men in um, and women uh, in that were in Jacksonville. Darnell Cookman, who was, uh, you know, the other part of the Bethune-Cookman uh, college or now university. Um, a. Philip Randolph, James Weldon Johnson and his brother who wrote um, Lift Every Voice and Sing. Uh, so I remember growing up in Jacksonville and feeling like there was something special about my city because all these historians had uh, lived and breathed uh, there uh, in that space. And you know, when you, um, Dr. Rivera, when you mentioned um, Shirley Chisholm, I was planning on mentioning her because she's my sorority sister. But not just because she's my sorority sister, but also because, as you said, uh, she blazed that trail that made today's history possible. Uh, you know, she stood up to everyone who said, you know, you're taken away from the ticket. You need to, you know, step down. And she was like, no, I'm doing what I think is right. And for women in particular, that can be really hard to do. So she definitely is one who I think of. Uh, and then, but then, you know, they laugh because I always mention my sorority, but the women of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, our first act of public service in 1913 was marching in the Women's Suffrage March. And, um, you know, a lot can be said that we were, as women, none of us had the right to vote. Um, and even during that time when the other women in that march um, were frustrated because my sorority sisters were black and forced them to march in the back, they said, you can tell us to march wherever you want, but we will be here and we are going to stand up for our rights. 
And so um, there is so much history that goes unknown uh, and that, you know, and of course, Rory, I didn't, uh, the, everything you talked about with the media and um, the opportunity to uh, tell stories and normalize uh, Black people as human beings and normalize Black experiences is probably more impactful uh, than, you know, saying you know, all the history and, and kind of, except living it. Like, other than living it, I, I don't know um, what's more impactful than media. So thank you all so much for your comments. So we want to dig a little bit deeper. Um, how do you- Dr. Miles, like can I add something real quick? I'm sorry, I didn't mean, so I, I just clicked on the, the chat and there was two things that, that came up that struck me. So one, somebody made a comment about Billie Holiday and the song Strange Fruit in 1939 that was uh, written about the, the protest of lynching a black American. So I just wanted to make that mention um, because Billie Holiday being so influential uh, of a recording artist, um, I just thought that was a, a great comment, so. Yeah, and thank you for looking at the chat because as I said, it is not being monitored. So <laughs> I didn't realize that there were comments going on. Um, so, uh, but to dig deeper, I wanna ask all of you, anyone can answer who wants to, how do you feel black history helped uh, to tell the story of what it means to be an American? And how have African-Americans enriched this story of America? Any, Gail? Yeah, well, I, um, I'm gonna go back to something that Rory was saying and he talked about the negative images and they have been in the media for a very long time. I mean, all you have to do is Google Jim Crow and you see horrendous things that are in the media from um, you know the last hundred years or so. But um, one positive thing that I like to do is find a way to tell a story that um, when we have people, especially young people come in to view our museum that we can have a story. For example, I found out that there was a battalion in World War II. We all knew about the Tuskegee Airmen, but there was a battalion called the Black Panthers and they were the most fearsome um, tank battalion in World War II. It was an all black battalion that was asked for by Patton and they got all these medals, Purple Hearts, um, all kinds of um, awards at the end of it. They stayed in the arena uh, in the Battle of the Bulge longer than any other group that came in. Most groups would rotate in and out for two weeks. They stayed 183 days. So that's the kind of positive history that I like to share because when we look at World War you know, one or World War II, we see, you know, all the glory stories of people that they tell. And it sounds like you know, there were no black people there where black people have fought in every single, you know, war that there has been in this country. And so there's a story that goes along with that for any place you want to plug into history. And so I just wanted to share that because, you know, um, Mr. Bozeman had just died when I was working on that. And I was just like, wow, this is awesome. You know, that there really was a Black Panther um, battalion that, um, is there. And the, the good thing that I have found is that our national archives actually document all these things. So if you have a question, you can find an answer to it. If you think that there was a Black person, you know, we always learned about Crispus Attucks that was there at the Revolutionary War. They're going to have a story about who he was and his descendants and all of that. So um, Rory, I think that as a young person, you know, you keep looking at how to um, create positive images. Because if it wasn't for a young person with an idea, like a young Oprah Winfrey or a young um, Ava DuVernay, then you know, we wouldn't have a lot of the things that we have now because um, you know, people would just like you know, say, oh, you can't do that. Nobody's ever done that before. And we wouldn't have had a Barack Obama, you know, who was one of the youngest presidents as the first black president as well. So I say you just keep, um, don't, don't look, don't dwell on a negative, but find another positive aspect to it and dig a little bit deeper. And um, sometimes just follow the rabbit hole of information to where it leads you. And you just find that you, there's so much out there that you can share with your friends and with other people in generations to come. All right. Um, yeah, I, um, I guess, you know, that's my background, media studies. Um, so 
I was going to go off of what um, Miss Regina said. Um, basically, like telling the stories of Black people is so necessary um, to really kind of making us Americans. I mean, we are Americans, but one thing when you hear Americans, everyone's mind go to goes to a white man. Um, it never goes to a black man or a black woman. It always goes to a white man, not even a white woman sometimes. Um, and you know, watching films and film class, we 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 go to Birth of a Nation, uh, which is I, I have never watched it and I probably never will, but I might just to see um, what it is. Um, but it's one of the most racist films of all time. And then to like pick it, like to go off of that, they made Gone with a Win, which is also pretty racist. Um, even though that did birth, you know, black people being at the um, Academy Awards with Hattie McDaniels winning best supporting actress for her role in that movie. And I think that that movie spawned more black artists getting into um, media, especially film. But then, you know, when we started having people in the seventies like Spike Lee and um, even, I guess you could say Steven Spielberg for giving the color purple a platform um, of that magnitude. I think that watching these movies um, let us see the stories of black people. And of course, uh, at first they mostly were slave movies um, but we've definitely seen this new resurgence of, not even a resurgence, just a surge of films that are not slave movies that are telling history that isn't slavery. Um, I think I'm gonna probably watch it tonight or sometime this week, but the new movie Judas and the Black Messiah, uh, Black Messiah, my bad, is about Fred Hampton's assassination. And now that is spawning a lot of conversations about the Black Panthers um, and whether or not, you know, they would be still how they were back then now and what the word of Fred Hampton is going to like lead us into the future. And I think that watching these type of stories is going to allow us to see the black history, but even we don't have to, you know, make every story real and still make it black history. Like the film, the photograph, I, it's a rom-com, but it still tells the story of black people and it has a historical factor in it. And I think that as long as we're sharing these stories of Black people and making them, you know, as authentic as, authentic as we can be, that's going to make us seem to, I guess, the regular mainstream crowd that we are Americans, that we are, you know, a part of the society, that we have been a part of the society, and that we're not just slaves or, you know, victims of police brutality, that we are regular human beings who feel emotions and go through things. Um, but yeah, I just really want to, I'm probably going to have a lot of media. Uh, I feel like I'm going to be the media background. But, um, and I just think that having these films are going to help a lot of the younger audience um, learn about a lot of things. Because I, I will be honest with you, I didn't know about hidden, like the women in Hidden Figures until Hidden Figures came out. And I don't think a lot of people knew about that. And I think that I mean, I don't know what type of films I'm going to make. Maybe I make, you know, a biopic film, but I think for the next generation of filmmakers, we're going to have to tell stories that no one else is going to tell until there aren't any more stories to tell. But at that point, <laughs> like we'll, we'll all be gone. But that's, that's the point It's like, we need to keep telling these stories until there are no more stories. So, yeah. No, when you were talking, I, I, it, it triggered two thoughts in me. The first one was this, the phrase that's being used, normalized being Black. And then the other one is, uh, I thought about the, the movie um, Get Out. And when it first came out, everybody was like, it's a horror movie. It's, oh, and the people went to see it. Like, oh my God, it's so good. And I watched it and I was like, I, I was confused. I was like, why, why did anyone, why are they saying this is scary? This is everyday life. And then I was like, oh my God, that's why it's scary. <laughs> <laughs> because of course there was you know artistic license right but a lot of the microaggressions and the cringy comments and the, the stuff it just felt so normal that I was just like well how did this get funded I was so confused <laughs> um but I truly appreciate um the comment Dr. Rivera did you want to add anything yeah so you know when you just think about every aspect of what has made this country take the next step Black people are at the forefront 
of helping this country take the next step. Sometimes it's in the event of tragedy, but most of the time it is an uplifting and taking things to that next level when nobody else has been able to. Um, also, I think a, an important part of, of this and looking at uh, Black history and its, its foundation in, a, in American history um, is this is a perfect time in the highlighting as uh, Ms. Phillips had mentioned and Rory has mentioned, you have mentioned as well, but also the, the opportunity to get it right, right? So we're not a race, but correct and make sure that people are getting it right, that there are certain things. And I remember talking to my sons one time and we were talking about the Wild West. And I said, you know, it, it still irks me that every movie about cowboys, they don't show black cowboys. But about 25, 30% of the cowboys in the Wild Wild West were black, but they never talk about those, those situations. So um, this is an opportunity to, to see the, the underpinning uh, that the growth of this country and the prosperity of this country, a big part of all of that is rooted in black history. Yes, there are some bad times, but when you look at most of the positive things moving forward, there has been African-Americans at the root of it to help push this country in the right direction. Yeah, I, I wanted to just um, um, add on to something that Rory said earlier too, where he said, when you look at um, the history or you know, through educational uh, or movies even, that most things that we see are through the lens of a white male. And that's a part of the institutional and cultural racism that plagues our country, really. And that's a part of why I think we'll always have to keep talking about this. You know, at the opening, you know, um, we, you know, we talked about, Craig talked about having to have difficult conversations. And that's where we have to go with these because if, if, if people don't wanna hear about how um, blacks have been portrayed in, in, in social media, even going back to the war stories, I have saw war movies growing up. I saw cowboy and Indian movies growing up, but you didn't see blacks portrayed in there. So we had an exhibit of black cowboys that came from the Agricultural Museum in um, Putnam County, which was an awesome exhibit. And I had somebody sit to my face and say, there were no black cowboys. And I'm telling him, I'm getting this exhibit next week. There were no black cowboys in Florida. And I'm like, I've been to, um, you know, to Oklahoma, to the Black Cowboys Museum there. I didn't know as much about the history of black cowboys in Florida until we got the exhibit. But I'm telling him this and he's still telling me, no, it do doesn't exist. So how do you overcome that part of what's in here with a lot of people? There's this mental blockage because they've been fed a myth for so long that Blacks were not there and Blacks were there, as you're saying, Dr. Rivera, at every step of the way. And because we were not writing the history books, Rory, that's why the stories are not in the history books, but hopefully we have an opportunity to get it right uh, for the next generation and generations to come. So all those things that have been, you know, um, either just ignored or perverted in terms of how the stories were told, we do have the opportunity to get it right. And there's so many historians, I am just elated when I see the number of people who have taken history as their mantle to just go forth and tell the truth about how this country was formed and how this country, you know, even the good, the bad and the indifferent. And, you know, there's some ugly, a lot of ugly, you know, we, we have to talk about that too, but how people are taking that on as their daily work to be able to tell people through their writings and through their documentaries, through their films, through whatever, that so, so there's some history that you didn't get to hear the right part of, or you didn't get to hear it the right way. Rory, go ahead. Um, I just want to add something to what Ms. Phillips said um, about the white author for Black Stories. Um, it was it's crazy because I just saw a tweet about that, and it was in a jokingly manner, um, kind of, but it was, it was a part of a conversation about how do we let uh, white people, you know, talk about Black people and, and whether or not it's in a historical context or a fictional context, how do we, you know, how do white people genuinely tell black stories 
from not a black um, per, um, point of view. And I think if, I, I mean, this is probably for more of the younger crowd, but there's a film called Malcolm and Marie that just dropped on Netflix that starred John, um, John David Washington, which is Denzel Washington's son and Zendaya, who is, is Zendaya, that's self-explanatory, but um, it is written and directed by a white man, but it's a black story. And there's actually lines in there um, I tried to pull it up on my phone and it was a line that was critiquing Moonlight. Um, and I believe the line was, um, is I think it was like, because Barry Jenkins is a gay, is that why Moonlight is so universal? And and as a as a black man, I never like had that thought as like, oh, because Barry Jenkins isn't gay, that like Moonlight is so universal. But like when you think about a white person writing all this critique, because he does critique Barry Jenkins, he does critique Spike Lee, he critiques all these black artists in this work of art. Um, how does that look as, you know, coming as a black person watching these black people talk about these things? And it's just kind of crazy that, you know, I mean, yes, Steven Spielberg did a great job with The Color Purple, but there's so many directors who didn't do great jobs with black stories. Um, you know, even though there's, there's a lot of people who, are conflicted about Django Unchained and how that was written by written and directed by a white man in which that director in the movie says the n-word you know and so like everyone is very kind of like conflicted on whether or not we should allow white people to tell black stories because most of the time that's the only way they're going to get made but at the same time do we really want a white person to tell our story like imagine if you know, Black Panther was directed by a white man. Would it have the same cultural impact it did when it dropped? Um, and so I just wanted to throw that kind of comment out there. I don't want to, you know, make our time go too long. Yeah, I don't want us to go down that particular rabbit hole, but I do think that is um, a really important point. And when you said, when you mentioned that movie, I kind of cringed a little bit because that movie did not seem to be a, a movie telling a black story. That was a movie using black bodies to uh, present a picture of toxicity, right? That movie was terrible. But anyway, not here to be a film critic. Yeah, um, I, I, if I can, I can't just, you know, it's like, that is a horrible movie, but there is, a, there is some truth in Django Unchained because, I mean, I just finished reading about a case in um, today that where, um, you know, and this is before Nat Turner, where all these people rebelled in what was Georgia that's now South Carolina when um, they were, um, they killed all these people on this plantation and they eventually were caught of, car, of course and, and they killed them all, but there was a black rebellion where they attacked the whole plantation and the owners and the overseers and everybody. So those kind of stories did exist. Oh, uh, let me clarify. I'm sorry. I was not referring to Django as a terrible movie. Oh. I actually really like Django. I was talking about Malcolm and Marie. That movie oh, is okay. terrible. I haven't seen that. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on, uh, I will just kind of quickly, I saw someone uh, in the chat made a comment about um, the Buffalo Soldiers working to establish uh, the national parks and that the national park system has been working hard to publicize that story. So I didn't want that to, um, to go unnoticed. And one other thing I'll say about um, you know being black being a part of the American story, I tell I did a um, study abroad in France, and I tell people all the time I didn't know what it meant to be American until I went to France, because every time for for my in, the entirety of my life when I was in America I was black, and it was not until I went to another country that I was like oh like my my way of being my the the um, the the fact that I think I can go run errands during lunch is uniquely American. Uh, my expectations of time and space are uniquely American. And that's when I really fully understood. And, and that, you know, it's kind of a shame that we have created this uh, dichotomy in this country where American is white and everybody else is anything else. But moving on, it's time for one last question, I think. I want to make sure you all get a chance to, to answer it. Do you think there should ever be a time when there isn't a need to promote Black history? Will we, in your opinion, just outgrow this Black History Month? Um, I'm just gonna go first so I can get all my thoughts out first. Um, I have like a counter question to that. Uh, will we ever feel the need to stop having war movies? Um, you know, because 
like we have so many countless World War II stories. Literally, I think every year there's another World War II story that comes out, whether it's fictional or it's real. There's always a, another World War II film that is Oscar bait immediately, probably written by like one of the top directors, has somebody who's a great um, actor. And those never stop. And I mean, of course, I always say, why do we need another one? But it's almost like someone is saying, well, we need to keep telling the story. You know, if we don't let, if we don't tell the story, history is going to repeat itself. And I think of Black history, if we don't keep saying this stuff, it's going to repeat itself. And you kind of almost see it repeating itself. It's like, we're still going, there's every so often, there's another like revolution. You know, we had the revolution to end slavery. Then we had the revolution to end segregation. Now we're having a revolution to just live because police brutality and uh, people like George Zimmerman killing unarmed black um, kids because he was a kid. Um, and just having us, you know, relive these type of events where we, we're now having to have a you know, a, not even nationwide, a worldwide phenomenon just to be Black and just to be human. I think that we need to keep telling the Black history, not even, not, I mean, just to like get to us being treated like humans, but also even past that, because I feel like once we forget what happened, that's what's going to doom us all, because I feel like that's the main thing with Confederate monuments is that if you don't recognize why these monuments were there or why they were being teared down or tore down, you're not going to understand like the past and then that's not going to help you for the future. So I think there will never be a time where we don't have to talk about black history or even, you know, there will never be a time. That's yeah, that's my simple answer. All right. Your answer is accepted. <laughs> uh, Gail, Dr. Rivera. I agree. I, I think until we get to the point where um, we don't have to be uh, uh, viewed as uh, second class citizens by anybody, then, um, you know, we will continue to have to tell our stories. And even if we get to a point where we're an anti-racist society, I still think the, 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 culture and the complexity and the contributions that uh, we've made as a, um, a social group uh, to the history, uh, to the fabric of this country still needs to be celebrated. No different from we have Women's History Month, we have, you know, uh, Native American History um, um, Week, <laughs> or, you know, Hispanic History Month. We have all of these things that we still celebrate and so um, we, we can still continue to celebrate the rich culture of uh, the African heritage in America. And I think will always um, be a need to promote that. Great. Dr. Rivera, you get to have the last word on this one. Oh, wow. So um, I agree. I think even if we reach the point where everybody can hold hands and sing Kumbaya and we're living Martin Luther King's dream, we need to have Black History Month. Um, this makes me think of a comment, uh, Morgan Freeman has always come out and said, it's just history. Why do we need Black History Month? Um, and a lot of people have actually thrown that at me as a comment. They were like, well, Morgan Freeman thinks. And I was like, who made Morgan Freeman the ultimate authority on Black History Month, right? He's, he's an actor and yes, he's a respected actor, but who made him the authority on whether Black History, history Month should maintain or not? I think it should always maintain. I think it should always be there. It should always be celebrated. Um, I had this conversation with my cousin. I've had conversations with my brother. And they said that each culture should be able to celebrate its accomplishments and other cultures join in on that celebration because it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing to celebrate. And even if we reach a point where we're recognizing that everybody is equal and everybody's being treated fairly and everybody's being treated the same. We still need to celebrate what these different cultures bring. Um, so I, I never want to see Black History Month go away because I also think for some people, this is a great refresher. 
um, you, you kind of get in a rhythm sometimes. And, you know, I said, we celebrate black history every day in our, in my household, but sometimes you get in a rhythm and you watch TV and you watch movies and you see these things over and over. And sometimes you forget at how significant of what you're watching plays back to uh, one of those past events. And I'll use Jackie Robinson. And this will be the last point I make on this. Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier is the framework for Major League Baseball now recognizing Negro League Baseball statistics, right? So it happened to come up around the time that Black History Month was going to be coming up. It was emphasized and pushed. We need to always have those refreshers and celebrations. Uh, and Babe Ruth said, um, no, Josh Gibson is not the white Babe Ruth. I'm actually the white Josh Gibson. Right. So he he acknowledged the greatness of Josh Gibson. And that's what Black History Month is all about, acknowledging the greatness and celebrating all the good things. And, and, and I hope it never goes away. I, I really do. Yeah. All right. Well, um, we have time for questions and we have one question in the Q&A box. So I will read that question. Uh, it's, it's actually it looks like it's just one question, but it's a lot. So this one is actually for you, Gail. Um, the question is, why would Black history focus on the Moors of Northern Africa and their influence in Spain? Since I thought that uh, the Muslim conquests, I don't want to say it incorrectly, were an invasive colonizing force from the Arabian Peninsula into North, Northern Africa. Is, if that's the case, um, and that outside force was controlling Northern Africa, wouldn't that be a negative invasion force that one wouldn't seek to celebrate in Black history? No, because there's so much more to the culture of that. Um, one point is to show that not only were Blacks enslaved, Moors enslaved people, yes, they did. So we show this story to show people that slavery doesn't mean Black and Black doesn't mean slavery. And if you get nothing else out of the Moors story, that's fine. But there's so much more, there's such a rich culture that the Moors also brought to um, Iberian coasts, um, culinary things, science, shipbuilding, and all those things that impacted the world. The, before there were Vikings, there were Moors sailing around the world. Okay, so, you know, I just, you know, people, if they don't understand it, then, you know, it's up to us to teach them. And that's why we can't rely just on one month to be able to teach people. We have to be able to have um, curricula that's in our public schools so that children can get information about science and, 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 and history and education and the arts and all the different disciplines that African-Americans contributed to in this country. And I don't think you can go to any area where there hasn't been major contributions by, by black people in this country. So that's why you know we tell the stories of the Moors. And I mean, you bring up a good point, even with the question, sometimes that sometimes um, that since the history of black people focuses on the negative, we don't always know the full story. And so it's either slavery or, um, well, you really should be happy we brought you here because otherwise you would be stuck in Africa where all these terrible things are happening or with all these terrible people. Uh, and, and the reality is our history is rich. And um, there is so much more than just the, the little bit that we've been allowed to learn uh, from our textbooks written from a perspective that did not value the contribution. So thank you for um, clarifying. So any final comments in the last couple of minutes from anyone on our uh, panel? I wanna give you a chance to do some closing thoughts. Actually, I'll, do you mind if I just kind of talk? I just hope people realize how important Black History Month actually is to just history. It, it is so important. And the focusing or the highlighting is not discounting other cultures or anything like that. It's focusing on the good things that help contribute to our, our society today. And, and I hope more people can, can take that and look at Black History Month as an opportunity to learn something new and different about where they live in this country, so. Yeah, so at the beginning, I think it was Craig and his introduction talked about having, uh, have you ever had a conversation or when's the last time you had a conversation with somebody about something you cared about? And at the end of that conversation, 
you ended up changing your mind. And that means you listen to that person that you got to um, reason with them because, um, you know, I, it, I'm engaged in these conversations every week um, on their vision um, conversations. And we talk about all kinds of things. And that's one of the things is to try on what another person is experiencing or what they think. And that means you, it requires you to hear their story. You cannot um, try on, I can't try on your story, um, Dr. Rivera, uh, because I'm, I'm not a male, okay? I'm not a Hispanic male, I'm an African-American woman. And so I would never be able to try on your story, but I can listen to your story and listen to your experiences and, and, and empathize with, with that from a human perspective. And that's all we ask anybody to do as we tell our stories about African-American history so that um, we're not left out or omitted from the history books because it's American history. It, it's plain and simple, just American history. And you, know, you bring up such a good point that um, when we think Black, we tend to have uh, this expectation that, that Black people are a monolith. And even on this panel, we have so much intersectionality. Dr. Rivera is Afro-Latino. Mm -hmm. You're a Black woman. I'm a Black woman. Rory Thompson is a young Black man. Like We have so much um, that, that is being Black is, is so, so big and so small at the same time um, that we also have to get to this space of understanding that there's, we would, we could go decades and not uncover every piece of our history um, across the world. Rory, did you want to make a final comment before we close out? Um, I was just going to say, um, and during this time of COVID, we have a lot of time to spend at home. Um, I know that we are kind of transitioning into a period of some, some type of normalcy, um, but I think that since we have this time to stay home, just read, you can go to Barnes and Noble, get some books. Um, there's so many books about um, black stories, historical or fictional. Um, there's so many black movies, historical or fictional. There's so many uh, black TV shows, historical um, and fictional. So it's almost like there's no, there's no excuse to say that you don't, don't know about this when there's so many resources that you have. Um, like after this, I'm probably gonna go eat, but after that, um, I definitely am going to watch like Judas and the Black Messiah. Um, and I'm going to, you know, I, I don't know much about the assassination. I know that um, it's, it's, there's a lot of uh, controversy with it um, via the government. I'm not going to get into that because that's another whole panel in itself. But there's so much that you can learn just by taking the time to just want to learn um and you don't have to be in college to learn you don't have to be in school to learn just taking like a couple hours of your day to watch something that is a part of a different culture than yours i try to watch um hispanic films just to you know be a part of this different culture even though i'm not going to you know fully understand it's something that i can try to understand so and also i just say this um watch black stuff that isn't american there are good black Canadian shows. There are good black English shows. I'm watching a French show called Lupin on Netflix. That is a black um, French show. So just watch a bunch of different um, black content from Africa, from Asia, from everywhere. Just continue to immerse yourself in black content and just learn more. So yeah. Yeah, I actually watched uh, Judas and the Black Messiah over the weekend. I think I think you'll love it. Uh, so with that. I will close at first. Let me apologize. I didn't turn my light on before we started and now it has gotten dark. And so now I look like I'm highlighting myself in a Dateline episode, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank our panel for sure. This has been amazingly fun to moderate a panel um, of all Black people um, talking about Black history. I don't know that I've ever done that. And, uh, and thank you all for bringing so much knowledge and, and expertise to this conversation. Uh, for our audience, if you are interested in continuing to have fearless conversations with us, um, check out our website, flagler.edu slash fearless conversations to see our schedule and know what we will be discussing next month. So everyone have a great evening. Bye. Bye.